Good evening. Welcome to our first debate of the 2018 session. We have tonight with us Deborah Burchette and Kevin Blondin. And I believe it's district court position. We had a one. coin toss at the beginning. Deborah Burchette will open and Kevin will have second for opening statements. They'll each have three minutes for opening statements and then we'll move into questions. We also accept questions from the audience. We have some three by five cards back by the little cafeteria area there. If you'll get the cards to Ken, he'll get the questions up to me. We'll try and answer those questions. However, we have a little bit of a uh, information piece for you. Since this race is a little bit different, quick explanation. Candidates for judge have specific rules for campaigning for office. They cannot answer questions related to expressing opinions on political issues for example, positions on controversial topics like coal terminals, methanol plants, reproductive rights, immigration, other issues that cannot be discussed by judicial candidates. Why? It's about fairness. We want to make sure judges are expected to look at the facts of the case and make decisions based on the information before them without any political bias. These are not partisan races. They're likewise unable to answer any questions that ask them to say how they might rule on a particular case. Again, it's a matter of fairness. So if you're submitting a question and it's very political, I won't be using it. So just kind of keep that in mind. Plus my standard rule for questions, if you have a question about, did you stop beating your wife? Those aren't really questions. <laughs> Those are just you know trying to draw people into some sort of a, a strange position or something. So no political statements, actual questions, please. We'll run till approximately 8 o'clock, going back and forth in questions, assuming we have enough questions from our audience and a few questions we prepared to kind of get us kicked off and started. As I said, Deborah will begin. Kevin will go second. We'll alternate back and forth. I will read the questions. Don't necessarily need to see me in the image, Dwayne, so I can read from the side and you can see the two of them for your video. With that, I think I, oh, I forgot to mention, Ken has timing sheets. He will show you that at the two minute to go mark, at the one minute to go mark, is that correct? Two or minute, one minute, 30 seconds, shut up. Okay. <laughs> and that's a good cue for me to shut up. And uh, we will begin with Deborah Burchette, opening statement, please. Okay. Can you all hear me? Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight. As you know, I am running for uh, position one district court. And I want to tell you just a little bit about me and about what my plans are. And I have been a prosecutor for 20 years now. And I started out as, actually, I apologize. I've been an attorney for 20 years now. I was a prosecutor for the first four years. And I started out in Bellingham. And then I did Grace Harbor County. And then I came to Cowlitz County. And I started my own law firm 15 years ago. And when I started my own law firm, I actually mean I started my own law firm. My son, Josh, was uh, two years old at the time. And I started my practice, Deborah Burchett Law Firm. And I've been doing pretty much criminal defense for almost all of my career. And primarily, I've been doing it in district court. And what my office does is I do indigent defense, which is um, my office is the one where when you hear on TV, if you need an attorney, one will be appointed for you. That's what my office does. I have two other attorneys that work for me, and I have a full-time staff. And what we do is we provide criminal defense for Kelso, Kalama and Castle Rock. In addition, I'm a pro tem judge. What that means is a part-time judge, as most of you already know. I've been doing that since 2003 in Kathlama, 15 years. And I've been doing that for two years here in Cowlitz County. The reason I've been doing it two years in Cowlitz County is primarily because I was so busy, constantly working. I had the three cities. I did not have the availability. Then once I did have the availability, I began to pro tem. And I'm also ha handling cases that pretty much um, do not have to do with criminal at this point, so there's no conflicts. I do small claims, and I'm also doing traffic court. I put myself through college. I put myself through law school. I started um, as a secretary at IBM, worked my way up, and decided to put myself through law school and college. I adopted Josh when he was six days old in Grace Harbor County, and we moved here because my parents were here. I actually also was born here. And I also have a number of um, 
endorsements. I have Ann Rivers, who is a Republican senator here. I have Judge Gales in Superior Court. I also have the Democratic Central Committee. I have two prosecutors. So I have a number of endorsements. But more than that, if you will go ahead and look at my cards, I've got endorsements and testimonials from people whose lives I've changed. I've been very engaged in drug court, in uh, substance abuse, changing lives, getting people their license. And so I have a very holistic practice. I make sure that the people that I see, I make sure that we have a way to not have to see them again. I'm also very involved in mental health. So again, I want to thank you very much for being here, and I welcome any questions that you might have for me. Thank you, Mr. Blum. Three minutes. <coughs> and I should note, you don't have to stand at the podium. The microphone's there so that the video and recording is there, but you're welcome to do so. Okay. No, I, thank you. Uh, my name's Kevin Blonda. I'm also running for the same position that Ms. Burchett is. I've also practiced for about the same amount of time in Cowlitz County. We're 19 years, give or take a piece. Um, much of that time has been in the same arena, if you will, in terms of criminal defense. And I have the endorsements. I feel like I'm just spewing my resume on you at this point, but I have the endorsements of Superior Court Judge Steve Warning, Superior Court Judge Michael Evans, District Court Judge Ed Putka. I also have the endorsements of Superior Court Judge Doug Gells out of Wakayakin County, District Court Judge Heidi Haywood out of Wakayakin County. And you could say, well, that's what Kayakin County doesn't matter, but I'm the only person standing up here that actually has endorsements from judges within Cowlitz County. Most of my practice has been criminal defense. Um, I'm also endorsed by the ILWU, the local longshoremen union, uh, the IBEW, the electrical workers union. Um, it, it, when I was told I was speaking in front of Kim Batero's, um, forum at the Canterbury, I kind of had a different vision because I didn't expect to be in this building addressing this crowd. But nonetheless, I mean, I'm glad that everybody's here and that you're here to, to listen and then apply what you've learned to not only vote yourself, but maybe, maybe spread the word. I've spent most of my life here in Cowlitz County. I grew up here. I went to high school here. I graduated from here. I'm back again. I don't think any of that really matters, quite frankly, in terms of my ability to do the job that I'm asking you to vote for me for. The election process is um, its kind of alien to me because I'm not a politician. I don't run for office. I've never done this before. And so I'm not really familiar with kissing babies and being in parades and shaking hands. I feel like if we just put our resumes down and say, who's the better person for this particular position, you would say it would be Mr. Blondin. And so I'm hoping that that resonates, but I can't say that it will or it won't over the course of the evening. But nonetheless, I didn't adopt a child, and I don't think I should get points for that or not for that, because it has nothing to do with being a judge. And so I've been here, I, I'm familiar with the community, I'm ingrained in it, I have, and Ms. Burchett will say, well, just recently I started a pro tem. Well, at this point I still have more hours on the bench wearing a robe and acting as a judge in 2018 than she's had basically in her, in her entire career. And so my familiarity with the situation, my ability to hit the ground running is there and I just ask that you vote for me and I'm excited to hear some questions which will probably come a lot from, from her particular uh, corner. So I appreciate I, that. But think, it is yeah, no, I, I get the rules. Okay. The Question number one, we'll go to Deborah Burchette first. Uh, and I should explain the question format. You'll each have three minutes to answer the same question. You then have up to two minutes for rebuttal. You do not necessarily have to use the two minutes. And since this isn't so much a partisan race, I would expect sometimes that you'll decline and we'll move on to the next question. But you're more than welcome to have that two minutes if you like. So first up, Ms. Burchette, uh, question number one. What mentors have you had in your life and legal career, and how have they helped you to improve? What judges have influenced your philosophy and or profession? And I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I'll read it again. <laughs> what mentors have you had in your life and legal career, and how have they helped you to improve? What judges have influenced your philosophy and or profession? 
I think actually I've had a lot of mentors. I've had female mentors. I've had male mentors. I know that Sue Bauer was a great mentor to me as far as being a prosecutor, learning how to um, try cases. She's an excellent trial attorney, learning how to try cases, learning how to uh, figure out discovery, working with law enforcement. But I have to say that out of all the judges I've appeared in front of, Judge Koss has been absolutely my favorite judge. I have been in front of him for almost 15 years. In fact, often he says that we can finish each other's sentences. And he is very thorough. He's very fair. Everyone that comes before him is treated exactly the same as a person that is in the courtroom. He, and he, he gives fair sentences. And he is extremely uh, unemotional. And I just really, really have learned a lot from him. I've learned how to treat people with respect. And I've also learned how to work a case. And more than that, the difference between district court and felony court is that in felony court, you might go into court with five or six cases. District court, I'm going in with 40 or 50 cases. He has taught me, and I've learned, we move fast. We've moved through there. I know what I'm looking for. I'm prepared when I go in there. My cases are prepared. I never go in there unprepared. I never go in there not knowing what I'm doing. I'm not asking for continuances. So I have learned a lot from him how to be thorough, how to get things done, and how to move rapidly, and how to just keep the calendar going. And so I really appreciate Judge Koss. I think if I was elected, he is exactly the role model that I would want to emulate. And again, I think he's fair. And I also have learned a lot from being able to do trials. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Blondin. Would you like me to repeat it? She did, so go ahead. What mentors have you had in your life and legal career, and how have they helped you to improve? What judges have influenced your philosophy and or profession? Thank you. Uh, my biggest mentor in my life has been my dad. Um, he passed away at 45 years old of cancer. I'm not trying to make it a, a pity story, but when I was 22, when he passed away of cancer, he had taught me a lot of life lessons that I still carry. I'm sorry, addressing you. I should be addressing them. Um, that I still carry to this day. And what he was was a coach, a referee, a father, a brother, a husband, all the things that I want to have in my life. And so I've had that ability to, to kind of channel that. And part of the referee part, and that was a big part of his life, was he refereed a lot of soccer matches at the college level. And that's kind of what a judge is, is you, you're not in the game. You don't have a dog in the fight. You're not adversarial between defense and prosecutor and I've spoken to a lot of legal like the Long Beach Police Department, the Cowlitz, uh, uh deputies and they're like well you've always been a defense attorney like why would we vote for you and I, and I say I've never been on your team and if I'm a judge I'm still not going to be on your team I'm going to be the referee but at least you're going to get a fair shot at this and so I can hear the two sides and I know the issues. I'm, I'm well educated on the law and the, the underlying issues between negotiations and back and forth and uh, like basically admissibility of evidence, the inadmissibility of evidence. And I can make those rulings as a referee. And what I want to be is a neutral and just say, okay, you're right, you're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, and, and be kind of vanilla in the middle. I, I don't no longer have, I'm against you or I'm for you, but I'm now an arbitrary to the middle of saying you're right or you're wrong based on the law that's dictated to me by the legislature and the courts that are above me. And so he's been as, as long as it's been since he's been out of my life, it's been a long time, but he's still, I still have that kind of center of the ability to have the temperament to be on the bench and hear both sides and make competent decisions based on the law and not emotion or personal agenda. And that's what a referee has to be. I think that's really the role of a judge is to be a referee and not pull for one side or the other. But at the same time, when a deputy comes to me with a warrant and they want me to sign the warrant, I'm like, I can read that warrant because I know as a defense attorney, I could pick it apart. So you come to me and it's like, I want to go into this house and I want to go get into this person's cell phone. I'll say, here are the deficiencies in your warrant because if you don't correct those, somebody like me or a, one of my peers is going to blow that thing up and you're going to lose all your evidence. 
And so at, at some level, I am a kind of a, sorry, I just ran out of time. Not I'm not going to cheat twice. And you certainly have time for a rebuttal if you choose. So first of all, Ms. Burchette, would you care for any additional time on that topic? Yes. I think what I would say is that I, too, have done thousands of warrants. I have been a prosecutor, so I can look at it from a prosecutor's side as far as what it is they should be looking for, what they are looking for. And I can look at it as a defense attorney's side, too, as far as what a warrant needs to look like. And I think that it makes a huge difference if you can look at it from both sides. I've also done pro teming again, so I can look at it from all the different angles. I'm not going in there with a bias. You know, uh, defense attorney, this is the only way that I'm looking at things. And so I think that it gives you a broader spectrum of exactly what it is that you're looking for. And so that's why I think it's valuable to be able to have that well-rounded, well-rounded um, experience. Thank you. Ms. Blum, I assume you'd like to finish your statement. Nope. I'm good. All right. Question number two will be directed first at Mr. Blondin. What opportunities for improvement do you see in our current district court system? I would like to see more treatment-based opportunities, less incarceration. I don't mean let all the criminals free, but if there's an option between giving somebody a mental health program or a drug treatment program or an anger management program, it's a win-win because they're getting the tools they need to actually succeed with whatever deficiencies they may have exhibited in a certain moment. And it may be a habitual thing where they have a, a true problem or it may be it was a bad night and maybe they, they had an extra beer and they went home. But there's also people that habitually do that. And so there's people that have one DUI and don't learn. There's people that have three, four, five DUIs. That's a different issue. And then at that point, yes, we need to, for the safety of the community, we need to then impose some incarceration. And there's also restrictions and mandated penalties for people that suffer a DUI. You have to do a day in jail if you're under uh, 0.15. If you're over 0.15 or you refuse the test, you're going to do two days in jail. And I don't have any problem with that. I think that that slap on the wrist should be a wake up call for most people, but it's not. And sometimes you continue to reoffend after that. And so I would rather see people get the treatment they need to lower the recidivism rate, which means not reoffending. So if you can actually give them the treatment they need, I think the average around here is about maybe $76 a day for someone to be incarcerated in the Cowles County Jail. That's draining our tax dollars. That's draining the money that you've earned that you're paying back in. I'd rather see that go to the roads or something that's more meaningful than incarcerating somebody and paying for their green jumpsuit and their food and their bed and the staff that has to basically babysit with mace and guns, these people that are in jail, I'd rather see, let's fix the problem so they don't come back in because we do see a lot of frequent flyers in this, in this community. We see people that continue to reoffend, And I think it's because we lock them up and they come out with the same issues, the same deficiencies, the same problems they had when they went in, where if we treat them for whether it is Maybe it's a bipolar, maybe it's a methamphetamine addiction, maybe they're stuck on pills, whatever it is, let's fix that problem. We don't see them again and they can actually fly and spread their wings and do good things in the community. And I've been told to shut up. I missed that one. You had a better eye than I did that by Mr. Bond. Ms. Burchette, same question. Would you like me to read it? I got it. Okay. My practice in my office is what we call a holistic practice. That's what I tell my, tell my staff. When you come in my office, my goal is to help you fix your life so that I don't have to see you again. And the bottom line is this, is I realize that when people are coming to see me or with, when they're in court, this is the worst day of their lives. And we've probably seen them on the worst day of their lives. That does not mean that's who they are. What that means is it's something that they did. Now the problem with being a judge, or not the problem, but the reality of being a judge is you're walking a fine line. You've got to protect the community, 
but at the same time, you have to look at people individually. I get calls all the time from the jail that say, Ms. Burchett, we have someone here, they've got a mental health issue, what can we do? Those are the corrections officers. I built a good relationship with them. Then what I can do, and a lot of times they're not even my clients. They know they can call me and I can be responsive to it. I can call up parents at the jail, I know the contacts. Can you go see them in their cell, see what's going on? Is there anything we can do? I can talk to the judge. Is there any way that we can get the bail lowered? I can ask them, do you have a number I can call? Is there a family member I can get hold of? A lot of times it's substance abuse. Very rarely in all my years, 20 years of being an attorney, have I seen people that are really genuinely bad. I see people that are lost. We need those courts. We need those safety nets. We need those lines. Right now we have two women in jail. They have been in jail for 10 days, $80 a day, that is costing the city of Kalama because they were taking aluminum cans out of a recycle bin. That should never happen. We need to be able to get them out of there, get them the help that they need. And not only that, you also need to look to the budget. Whether you know it or not, the judges are also responsible for the budget over a million dollar budget. One of the first years I ever had Kelso, I saved them $300,000 a year. How did I do that? I go to the jail every single day. I am there every morning, or one of my people are, to make sure that bail is set fair, to make sure that they know that they are being arraigned with someone that is present. We absolutely need drug court. We need substance abuse court. There will be people that, in fact, need to be treated punitively. You can't keep driving drunk you know, and create a threat to society. However, we need to balance that with compassion, and I can do that. I know how to be compassionate. At the same time, I know how to be firm. I know that as a mother. I know that as a prosecutor. I know that as a defense attorney. I tell my clients when they come in, I am not working your life harder than you are. And if you want the help, I'm here to help you. If you don't want the help, then you're going to need to figure it out. But I think that we need to have those safety nets in place. I have been with the judges in the meetings where we've talked about the new type of court. I am a total advocate for it, and I think it's exactly what we need, and I think that that's where we're going today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blondin, any additional comments on that topic? Ms. Bichette, I assume you're okay I'm good. moving to the next? I'm good. Question number three will be addressed first to Ms. Bichette. Discuss your community involvement and how that might impact your understanding of issues in your role as a district court judge. I am involved in legal aid, so I am actually, I'm on the legal aid board, I'm actually working and helping the same community that in fact I am working with in district court. So I know what their problems are, I know what their issues are, I know what the complications are, I know the community that is in district court. I've worked with them for 20 years. I'm continuing that in legal aid. I'm also in the Kelso Rotary. We do a lot of really good things, and we work with the community. I am also involved in the uh, Red Hat thrift store, and there's a lot of different things I am involved in, but I'm gonna be really honest. A lot of people, when I decided to run, a lot of people were like, why haven't we seen you? Why aren't you out in the community? Well, I'll tell you why I haven't been out in the community, and Mr. Koenig, who's here, actually knows. I've been parenting for 18 years, and I'm not making an excuse. I'm not saying, oh, look at me, I'm a single parent. I'm just telling you the truth. My priority was being a mom. I worked all day, I went home, I parented Josh, I was all involved in the uh, robotics, but right now I'm in Rotary, I'm doing legal aid, and I am doing good out there in the community. So again, that's where I'm involved, and I'm very proud to be involved in the, in the activities that I am, and I'm also involved with Josh in his college right now. So those are exactly the type of, uh, types of things that I'm involved in. Legal aid is very important to me, and my community is very important to me. So again, that's what I'm involved in right now. Question. Would you like me to repeat? I'm good. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've been involved in the community since I came back here in 1999, where I almost immediately got on the YMCA board to help youth in the area and provide services to them on evenings and weekends and options for them. I've coached my, I've got girls that are now eighth and ninth grade. So if we, if we go back, since they were five years old, I've been coaching their soccer teams. I came and again, it's, I don't know how this necessarily is relevant to my ability to be a judge, but I went from a volleyball game at 3.30 today at Cascade Middle School, went to Centralia High School to watch the first half of my daughter's game 
she plays for Mark Morris as a freshman now at five o'clock, and then come back and appear apparently appropriate to address you all, even though it was raining in Centralia this afternoon. And so my involvement is with my kids, but I've also been on the Drug Abuse Prevention Center, which would seem contrary to what I do as, as typically during my nine to five, if you will, as a criminal defense attorney, it's like, that's job security. Like drug addiction, people using drugs, selling drugs, stealing from you would seem to be something that would resonate with me in terms of my, my bottom line and my income. And I'm working against that. I recognize the problems because I'm at the, at the ground level dealing with drug addicts and dealing with people. And I would maybe disagree to some degree with Ms. Burchett in the sense that some people, they need the slap on the wrist more than that. They need not to be in society and doing as much felony work as I've done. I, I tend to see that more often than being what district court is, which is kind of the shallow end of the pool in terms of these are like, if we don't correct these problems down here in terms of drug addiction, alcohol, abuse, like violence, they're going to migrate up to the deep end of the pool, which is where I typically swim. And so I'm saying if we can stop that, some of that stuff at the lower end with treatment and those options, I think that we would be better served in the long run and we save some money and we can save some lives. And I've seen it because I do a lot of misdemeanor work, don't get me wrong, and I've done a lot of pro teming in district court. So I've seen it here and I see where it elevates to. And not everybody in the shallow in the pool goes to college. And I, I credit Ms. Burchett for sending her son to college. He may have had a, a rough start because of the background that he had when he, when he was born, but that's a great thing. And I wanna see more of that, but I want to be a part of facilitating that for other people that necessarily aren't my son and, and kind of get that thing going. And so, yes, I'm involved in the community. I have been with the boards that I've been on. I had to, I don't had to, but I, I'm on the Mark Morris Foundation Board. I had to go pick up 350 hot dog buns, bring them to the football stadium on Thursday because they're doing a fundraiser for scholarships for kids. And I know half of you are probably Ari Long fans, but I did do that for the Mark Morris Foundation. Thank you. Ms. Burchette, any additional comments on that topic? I would. I'm not sure I would phrase it as a shallow end of the pool. I think I would make it more the critical part of, uh, of the court system. I will tell you that since I started doing it, I've done 7,800 criminal court cases in district court alone. And I've also done superior court cases, so I've been involved in all kinds of cases. Like I said, almost 8,000. And it is not just about uh, drugs. I have spent hundreds of hours talking to people about how do you get your driver's license. It sounds like it's a minimal, uh, a minimal thing, but you know what, to some people it's a lifeline. If you can't drive, there's a lot of other things you can't do. So I spend a lot of time, in fact, I have spent hundreds of hours just with the Chiquis community, teaching them how to get a driver's license. This is how you get a social security card. This is how you get yourself legal. Because the other thing that goes along with that is not just you get a driver's license, you get self-esteem, which is invaluable. I do not consider it the shallow end of the pool. I consider it the critical end of the pool. Because if we can stop it in district court, chances are we may not have to go any further at all. So again, I think it's extremely important court and it changes lives. And I think that that's what we want as citizens here in Cowlitz County. Juan, any additional comments on that topic? No. I know Ken's busy timing. I haven't had cards come up. Marnie, could you bring cards up for anybody that have filled out back there? Or if they brought them to Ken, I don't know. Thank you. Question number four will go first to Mr. Blondin. Please tell us about a case you've handled in your career that has helped shape your philosophy about your own work as a lawyer. That's actually, I mean, as many cases as I've tried and had, the hardest cases are where you believe your client's innocent. Because I have to represent a lot of people that maybe I don't necessarily have a lot of faith they didn't do what they did, but I still will do my best to uphold the structure of the law. Did the officer Mirandize you? Did, did they have a valid warrant? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of roadblocks into convicting somebody and I've made a living off of 
exploiting those deficiencies on the state side. And the hardest cases that any defense attorney will ever have are the ones where you really believe that your client's innocent. And two and a half years ago, give or take, uh, I tried a two week aggravated murder trial where I was convinced my client didn't actually kill the woman he was accused of killing. And the only sentence if he's convicted of that particular charge is life without parole. And the stress that I had, the sleepless nights that I had, because the only thing between him and a wrongful conviction is me. And I handled that case by myself. There was a lot of DNA evidence. There was a lot of witnesses. There's a lot of cops that testified. And I had that underlying faith in my client, which I honestly, I don't always have. I've tried a lot of cases where I don't necessarily know that he's or she didn't do it, but I'm gonna do my job to the best of my ability. And I've had cases, whether it be an assault or a breaking and entering, where it's like, I don't know that they're actually guilty. And those are the ones that keep me up at night. And so the, the highest stakes case I've ever had was a jury trial that lasted two weeks. My client was ultimately acquitted, and I think rightfully so. But I don't know that I would have been able to carry on as a healthy individual personally in my soul if I let him down. And that that's kind of the, the magnitude of why I don't want to have the highs and lows anymore of representing people to the effect that I have on their lives because the stakes are so high. I'd rather be the referee than play a game with someone's life and maybe I don't win, but in that case I did and I feel I feel good about it and that's that's a tough thing to do. And so that would be my my seminal case for me and why I want to do what I am doing now in terms of wanting to be a judge and where I was at with being effective at what I was doing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pichette, same question. You know, what people don't realize, and again, I've done this long enough to know, that people's lives are also affected and can be ruined in district court. And I think you have to be very cognizant of that. A lot of people don't realize. And again, I agree with Mr. Blondin. College is not for everybody. College should not be for everybody because you have to find what's right for the individual. However, in the state of Washington, if you have a joint, right, a small joint of marijuana, and you're under 21, if you get caught with that, and you were prosecuted for that, and that goes on your record, you are not able to get federal student loans for school. And it may sound small, but on the other hand, I am always cognizant when I am looking at these types of situations, I'm looking at the big picture. How is this going to affect their life down the road? What's going to happen 10 years from now if they can't get into the service? What's going to happen if I don't go for a deferred to get this off the record? I think it is extremely important to give sentences that allow people to go on to live their lives in a meaningful way. Whether it's college, whether it's joining the service, you've got to always be cognizant of that. And we make those decisions in district court. And we also have extremely important decisions that we have to help them make to look beyond the situation. I had a case not long ago, and um, it was extremely hard. His name was Carver Peterson. I don't know if you've heard of Carver. Carver um, and his parents allowed me to talk about this. In fact, his father is on my team. Uh, and he works for me. He's a uh, fireman and uh, fire captain, actually, in Clark County. And his son got a very minimal offense. He was doing donuts in Kalama. He ends up, he's going to college, he's got a great life, never been in trouble. All of a sudden, he has a criminal charge. I worked extremely hard. What can we do to get this off his record so that he can live with this? He felt ashamed. He felt he left his father down. You have to look at solutions, particularly with Carver or with his father, that they can go on, they can move on, they can go to college, they can be successful. We have to make those decisions. It's not just, we're not just refereeing, you know, minimum charges and everybody gets to leave and life goes on, there are life altering decisions that have to be made. Judges can decide that. Can I defer this sentence so they have an opportunity? Can I give them 
that chance to go to college, to join the Army? Can I get creative? Hey, can you go see um, someone over at the Army and come back and let me know, you know if you're going to be able to get in? We've got to be creative. We make important decisions in district court. We're not just sitting there refereeing. We can make a difference in people's lives. Carver's father told me, I'll never forget, after you worked his case, it's the first time my son has hugged me in over a year. And that made a huge impact with me. I have parents calling me all the time, look what you've done, look what difference you've made. That matters to me. And that matters to me more than anything else that I've ever done. And so again, we make impactful decisions. So to just think, you know, you. that we don't, we do. Uh, any additional comments, Mr. Long, on that topic? Ms. Burchett? No. Thank you. Question number five. We'll go first to Ms. Burchett. I should make a comment. I forgot to say at the beginning, it helps when you write your question if you print or something. I'm kind of old and reading somebody's cursive sometimes can be a challenge. Can changing tactics from incarceration to restorative save jurisdictions money? Will this help pay for the proposed community court? And it's mine? Yes. That, that is, thank you. That's actually something that is very near and dear to me. Again. My firm has three cities that we are responsible for. And the way that I look at it, I'm responsible for the client. At the same time, I also look at the city's budget. That's why I go to the jail every day. Number one, it's the right thing to do. And once I started going every day, rather than once a week, we're saving a tremendous amount of money because we're getting them out of jail earlier. We're able to argue bail. That right there is saving money. In addition, as Mr. Blondin alluded to, it's $80 a day. So if you can take that $80 a day, for instance, the women I was talking about, the aluminum cans, that's going to cost the city of Kalama almost $3,000 because they've been sitting in jail all this time. Now, if we had a mental health court, we could be, and I know for a fact, one of the women is mentally ill. Now, the problem with that is not just that she's mentally ill. You sit in jail for 10 days, it costs the city of Kalama $2,000. We get them out, we put them in mental health court. She doesn't decompensate. She did not have her medication for 10 days. So what complication does that create? Now she's going to get out. She's going to be worse than she was before. She has no idea where she is. Then we're going to have to get her over to mental services and hope that we can get her into mental health. We can use the 60 to $80 a day that we are spending there get them out, get them into some sort of court. What we can do is when they first come in, if we have a mental health professional, which we're already setting up, at booking that can call and say, you know what, Ms. Burchett, I'm flagging this person, we've got some issues, then we can get them out of the jail faster, save the city's money, and use that money in a more productive way so that you don't have the recidivism. Number one, it's not humane to keep them in there for that long if, in fact, they don't need to be in there that long. And number two, it saves a tremendous amount of money. Like I said, the first year I had uh, Kelso, Paul Brockvogel, who was a city manager, told me I saved the city $300,000 by going there every single day to make sure that people were getting out of there. Because number one, it's the right thing to do. And number two, it helps the cities, it helps the communities, and more importantly, it helps the individual so that they get the mental health that they need. And also, it helps you address the bail so that it is more appropriate so that people can possibly make the bail and get out. We can save a tremendous amount of money, we can do better, and we can apply it to some sort of court where in fact we can restore and not have the recidivism that we do now. Same question. Thank you. It's a little convoluted. You need to get re read it? Or? No, I okay. Thank you. A couple things. Um, I think I already mentioned my pro treatment disposition inherently in me, where I've seen those those options. And I may maybe it would seem deferential or or derogatory comment about the shallow end of the pool, but most of what I do is dealing with the people that migrate from this little problem they have, and I don't mean to minimize it, but now all of a sudden they're stealing cars, they're breaking into your homes, they're assaulting people, they're selling drugs in school zones. That's more of what my actual career has been about are the people that progress out of district court. And district, uh, out of Superior Court is, okay, so district court is misdemeanors, Felonies are Superior Court. So my life is more in Superior Court, but I'm very relevant and often in District Court 
whether it be as a judge or as a defense attorney. I, I'm, I'm relevant in that, in that community, and that's, that's something that I'm not trying to gloss over. But at the same time, a lot of the options you have in Superior Court, whether it be drug court, whether it be DOSA, which is a drug offender, sensitive, drug offender sentencing alternative, there's residential DOSA, there's prison-based DOSA, there's mental health court. There's a lot of options that are available to people in Superior Court that aren't available at this point in district court. And so a lot of the efforts to reduce the recidivism rate that Ms. Burchett's talking about exist already. And I, I live in that world and I want to bring that down to the people before they migrate up there and become what I call frequent flyers. Like, okay, she, she's back again, he's back again. Well, let's try to stop that reoffense and let's try to nix the problem before it expands and becomes a bigger issue. And so, yes, I'm absolutely pro alternative sanctions, whether it be the new community court that may or may not actually get off the ground. And I'm, I'm actually working with people presumptively, unfortunately, about trying to get those programs going so that they exist, so that people have those options that they can get the resources they need because a lot of people don't have that. Not everybody gets adopted by Debbie Burchett and all of a sudden they have all this ability, they have a lunch every day and they have stability and they have someone to say, no, don't hang out with those people. A lot of people don't have that structure. And so those people are the ones that need to be reached out to by the court. Most of those people that have that structure, that have a solid two parent family or a single parent family that's solid and is gonna support them and, and hold them accountable and, and make them get a job or make them play sports. They don't need those services, but there's so much of this community that needs that resource. And if it's the court that has to provide it and say, no, you can't act like that, then that's okay. I'm sorry, I just got cut off. Thank you, good timing actually. <laughs> Any additional comments, Ms. Bouchette, on that topic? Well, I think the comment is, and actually I think the question was about money. And Mr. Blunder did not address money at all. And what we're talking about is where we're going to get that money. And I'm telling you that there is a way to get that money. I've got the money. I have saved the money for the cities. I know how to budget. And the other thing that I want to bring up is we don't need somebody who primarily does superior court. We need somebody who's in district court. I've been there 20 years. I've done 7,800 cases. It's a different court. I don't think we need to bring anything down from Superior Court. We can have our own court. We can go ahead and have our own services. And we don't try murders in district court. This is the other thing we don't do, is we're going in there with 50, 70 cases a week. I do that every single week. We're not talking about frequently I'm in district court. I know it. I do it, I know how to live it, I know the community, and I think that's what you need. Talk about you know being able to hit the ground running. I know how to do the volume, I know how to work with the money, I know how to work the budget and find the money. And so again, I think that's extremely important, and I think that's what the community wants. Thank you, Mr. Blondin, would you like to address that again? Question number six will be directed first to Mr. Blondin. What will your top priorities be as a judge for district court? At first, honestly, this is probably going to be the toughest transition that district court's ever seen, is we have Ron Marshall recently retired uh, within the last, I would say, year or so. We have two district court judges that have been on the bench for 20 years. They're retiring. And so we're going from what was uh, Judge Marshall got appointed in 2011, so he had a good six-year run on the bench and then retired. We've got two judges that have been there long term. So we're going to have three new judges that haven't ever been in a robe as an elected or appointed official. And I, I think that's unheard of. And so as far as my agenda with district court is let's keep it in the short term. Let's just keep the, the progress going. Let's not just have a bunch of neophytes come in and all of a sudden it's chaos, but let's take, because I think Judge Koss and uh, Ms. Burchett labeled him as one of her primary sources of, of inspiration or whatever the question was in terms of his ability. Like, let's take what Judge Koss, Judge Putka, and Judge Marshall have done and let's continue that but let's expand on it in terms of the treatment options and the other things I've spoken about. And she saved Kelso $300,000, apparently. 
Well, as a judge, you have the ability to influence that in a greater effect. And I would like to be able to have that impact on the budgets, not only of the municipalities, the state, the county and district court and D. Workola's budget. If we can condense the dockets, I'm sorry, D. Workola is the district court judge that manages the clerks and asks people to come and pro tem and, and spend time on the bench. I didn't mean to just throw a random name out there. So you, you, you need to keep the continuity of the program going, but also then ultimately once, I mean, I hit the ground running, but let's start sprinting and then let's actually expand upon that. And Ms. Burchett says, well, let's not bring what the Superior Court has down to district court. Well, what Superior Court has is pretty solid. I mean, there's a lot of good programs that Judge Warning started the drug court program and we've got good things going on. Let's introduce that to district court and maybe we actually don't have as many superior court cases because we deal with the underlying issues in district court. So I would say what I want to do is decrease the budget like anybody does because I, I own a business too. I, I'm a partner in my law firm. I'm not just fly by night running around where I went, I went from IBM to the prosecutor's office, defense attorney, and then I couldn't do felonies anymore, so now I do uh, misdemeanors. Same question, Ms. I think what we need to do is we need to, first of all, we need to all get educated. And so I think what we need to do is we need to figure out, first of all, how it is that we're going to go ahead and um, split up the dockets. I think that all of us right now are pro temming, so I think that's a very good opportunity to go ahead and get that experience now, which is one of the reasons that I did that, is I wanted to pro tem to see if I could make a difference. I think we need to get educated. The other thing that I want to see is I want to see us address other issues, like address bail, make sure that we all have the same uh, continuity, the same philosophy. Right now, if you go in one courtroom, bail is going to be completely different than another courtroom. You go in one courtroom, there's a lot of continuances in another courtroom. We're on a short chain and we're moving. I think we need to have some continuity across the board. It should be transparent what courtroom you're in, exactly how bail is going to be set, exactly when the dockets are. I think you need to have that. I think that you need to know that there is going to be continuity regardless of what judge it is that you're getting, regardless of what city it is that you're appearing in front of. I think we also need to work on relationships. We need to have a good relationship with corrections. There's a terrible problem there right now. One computer system doesn't talk to the other computer system. And sorry if I worked at IBM before, but I did. And I don't like computer systems, particularly in a huge arena, that don't talk to each other. We're sitting in court and I'm asking the judge, can you give him credit for time served? With a new system, Judge Koss is like, well, I can't look to see how many days that is. That should never happen. We need to know exactly how many days they've served, give them credit, get all the systems working. We also need to have the latest technology. We're in one courtroom, the monitor doesn't work. We go in another courtroom, it does work. We need to have the systems working. We need to have relationships with the corrections. We need to have relationships with the probation officers. We all need to be on the same page and that doesn't always happen. I think relationships is a big part of it, uh, between the judges and between all the people that make this work. Corrections is extremely important, and they feel neglected a lot of times. I know they do. I'm over there every day. They're talking to me, you know, or we don't know, again, who's on pulling up a docket. It's ridiculous now, trying to figure out, you know, looking at jabs, looking at JIS, who's on the docket, who's coming up. We need to have some continuity on, in the technology, the systems, so that we're all on board, we're looking at the same things, and we're working with all the other uh, communities that work, in fact, in, uh, in Cowlitz County. Thank you. And Mr. Blumen, you were kind of cut off there at the end. Would you like to? No, I wasn't. Time? Ken cut me off, but that's just the clock. That's not Ken. <laughs> no, just briefly. Um, two things. One is continuity between the judges because if you get charged with an assault for or a shoplift or a trespass, the bail shouldn't be the same for everybody. If it's your fifth trespass and you have seven failures to appear, your bail should be higher than the kid that just wandered into a lot because he was an idiot and he went to sleep and it's his first offense. You can't just set, okay, for every offense of this particular type, 
that's the bail. No, if it's your fifth offense, um, no, that's not okay. You need to have a higher bail. If you never show up for court because you don't take it seriously, then your bail should be higher so we can assure that you'll be here for court. Or you can post bail that will ensure that you'll do that or you're going to lose money to your bondsman. So, no, I don't think that a, a standard across the board is appropriate because you wouldn't go, hey, Judge Putka, Judge Koss is here. Let's do $1,000 bail for all assault fours. You can't, you can't afford to do that because not all assault, for, assault fours are the same. Sometimes it's more egregious. Sometimes it's a habitual behavior. And I think the bail needs to reflect the actual behavior that you exhibited and the history that you have. And so let's be more reasonable about you, you need to be held more accountable and you need a number of bail because I know if I give you a, P, a PR, as personal recognizance, we're just going to let you go, which is what most def defense attorneys want. We always want our clients to be released. But if, if that's the situation and they, you know you're not, they're not going to show up for court for their pretrial, their readiness to issue a warrant, they come back in, they bail out, they don't appear again, they come back in. That's just a drain on the system. Let's just deal with them. If they need to be more strictly dealt with than somebody that's like, I had a bad night, it was my first time ever, I'm sorry, what do I need to do? And so then there's, there's, there's a different situation for everybody. And I think that a blanket, just kind of like a flat tax on people to bail out doesn't reflect their independent situation. And so, I don't necessarily agree with that, and that's that's all I have to say. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Burchette, any additional comments on that question? Yes. What I meant by continuity is that if you go in one judge's courtroom, even if you have five uh, failure to appears, it should be the same amount of money if you go into another judge's courtroom and you have five failures to appear. I'm not saying that you do not treat them um, harshly if they have a number, but the judges should all be on the same page as far as what that bail should be. If you have five thefts and you go in Judge Putkett's courtroom, it should be the same in Judge Koss's courtroom as far as a bail, as far as the release conditions. That's what I'm saying. They should not each run independently. So luck of the draw is what courtroom you happen to go in, or luck in the draw is you go in one courtroom, it gets continued for two years. You go in another courtroom, you have 90 days to get it done. I think you need to have that sort of continuity between the judges so that it doesn't matter where in fact you're arrested or you get in trouble, what jurisdiction, you're going to be treated the same primarily by the judge that you're appearing in front of. Thank you. So a little bit of a late start, but we're getting close to 8 o'clock and as promised we try to wrap that up. So I will move to closing statements and I believe Mr. Blondin you were first for closing statements. You have three minutes, by the way. That's okay. I know it's a work night, and we've all had a long day. And Ms. Burchett and I were in Woodland speaking to the Woodland Chamber of Commerce at lunch today. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I think you either resonate with what I'm saying or you don't. I've been in district court as long as Ms. Burchett. And she can claim a number of cases, but my cases are very case specific. And so I went to Woodland today, and I, I, I of course, attorney-client privilege precluded me from dropping any names, but a woman came up to me and said, you helped my daughter out. She's been sober for two and a half years now. And I told her her daughter's name, and I said to the mother, I'm like, you know, a lot of that is, like not just me, because I steered her into a recovery program, but was, I think that a lot of the reason she's succeeding and having a job and not reoffending, you should pat yourself on the back as a mom. You've done a good job. And mental health and drug addiction, anger issues, depression, they don't discriminate amongst people from good families and bad families. Like some people are more privileged. And I see a, a number of people that the expression is, you know, you, you started on second base and you thought you hit a double. No, a lot of people have those benefits. And Ms. Burchett's son had that benefit of a strong mother. My kids have that benefit of a strong mother and a strong father. And I hope that that's not lost on my kids. But at some point, if they struggle with some sort of a problem, whether it's abuse towards them or addiction or depression, 
It doesn't discriminate based on race or age or gender. Those things are across the board. And so I spoke to this woman and I said, I think a lot of, as much as you want to say nice job of helping my daughter out, it's like, no, she always had a backbone. She always had your support. She knew she had somewhere to lean on and you created the fact that your daughter is now sober for this period of time. And I appreciate that. And the fact that I actually could name the girl, that's only half of a violation of my confidentiality, but I could name the young lady and I recognize the mom because she came to every court appearance and it's been two and a half years. And I was excited to hear that she's doing well because I told her, I was like, she's a strong, intelligent woman. She struggles with an addiction and whether she fell into that because of exterior influences or whatever, she has you, she has a backbone. Not a lot of people have that. And so I just want to say I'm in favor of anything that will keep kids, young adults and older adults out of recidivism of coming back into the criminal justice system. I think it's a better use of our resources and that's what I would be advocating as a judge. And I appreciate you guys uh, putting up with us tonight and, and listening to us and thank you very much. Thank you. And Ken, you held that card up upside down that time. <laughs> that wasn't the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Rochette, closing statement. You have three minutes. Thank you. I think you know from hearing us that there are a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences as well. And I am dealing with district court clients every single day. And while um, Mr. Blondin may say, oh, she's had a number of cases, I have had a number of cases. I've had 7,800 cases at least. I've had hundreds of clients that have come to me. You've changed my life. You've taught me how to drive. You've got me into substance abuse and mental health. You know, the other thing that we've been talking about that we kind of, that we kind of didn't talk about tonight is that I have been running an extremely hard campaign. We've been working hard. Half of my team, in fact, are my clients. They're clients that I've worked for. They're clients that I have spent nights thinking about, got them off of drugs, got their kids off of drugs, and that's the greatest testimony I can think of. They've been parading with me. They've been doorbelling with me. They're out there working just like I am because I mean something to them. I've had clients come into my office and say, Ms. Burchett, guess what? I just voted for the first time. I didn't even know I could do that. And not only that, the other thing that I know is that I can show people how to vote. I can show them how to have a better life. It makes a difference. I take my life seriously and my clients seriously. Again, when they come into my office, it's holistic. First thing I say is, what were you thinking? And then we go on from there. And they want to know a better way. I've been in district court. I know how to do it. I was in juvenile court. I was a juvenile prosecutor. I know how to do that as well. And so again, I've got a wide, wide range of um, experience. I work my way up. I know how to work hard. I know how to sit in there. And I know how to be a judge. And I know how to listen. I've had people in small claims court actually leave and shake hands and say, I have never felt so heard. Because they want to be heard. They want to be known. I know how to do that. And again, it doesn't come easy. I've had to work at it. But I can make a difference. And I'm working to make a difference. And I'm working to earn your vote. And I know that I can do the job because I've been doing it for years. And again, I also know I can do the volume. I've been doing that for years. I know how to work with the cities. I know how to work with corrections. I know how to work with mental health. I know all of the resources. I've gone to St. John and work in the mental ward there. I know how to work with the people that are the most in need and how to steer them in the right direction. And I also know how to say to them, you know what? I am not working your problem bigger than you are or harder than you are and showing them the way. And that's another important part because it's not just helping them, it's having the discipline to let them go off and do it themselves. So again, I'm working hard to earn your vote. I would appreciate your vote. And I am thankful that I do have my son, which you seem to uh, really like my son too. So thanks. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Ken as well. He's gracious enough to call him the Botero Kelsch debates, but Ken's <laughs> doing all the work behind the scenes, getting the candidates lined up and organized, and I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming. It is important. It's part of our, our 
process, legislative process and, and electoral process in our country to come and listen to the candidates, listen to the different uh, viewpoints and figure out where they go. Appreciate the media, we have KLTV, and I forgot to ask the other video people which you represent, but it's another, it's online, I believe, for, for that. And I used to know the reporters by face, but I don't see anybody, so I'm not sure if anybody from the Daily News is here. They tend to change a bit more often than they used to. A special thanks to the candidates. It's difficult to put yourself forward and go through this, whatever race you're running in. I appreciate all the candidates doing that. Upcoming debates, next week we are scheduled a week from today, 7 o'clock Tuesday, September 18th at Canterbury Park, our usual location. That will be the Calais County Sheriff's race between Mark Nelson and Brad Thurman. The following evening we're scheduled for 7 o'clock Wednesday, September 19th at Canterbury Park for Calais County Treasure with Deborah Gardner and Karen Walker. That may change, we're getting some mixed signals, we'll let you know on that debate. Please get out and vote, and the, before I close, one of the most important things Ken and I always look for is suggestions. So if you have any thoughts at all of evaluating us to give us an idea of how we can improve, let us know. I'd also like to say thank you for those that submitted questions. We have a couple of great questions for other, other judicial races because I can save those questions for the other ones. With that, thank you all for coming. Thank you both.